It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, with the sun not shining and a look of hard, wet rain in the clearness of the foothills. I was wearing my powder blue suit with a dark blue shirt, tie, and display handkerchief. I was neat, clean, shaved, and sober, and I didn't care who knew it. I was everything the well-dressed private detective ought to be. I was calling out four million dollars. Good morning, Mr. Marlowe. Here to see General Sternwood. Come in, sir. I'll tell the general you're here. The main hallway of the Sternwood place was two stories high. Over the entrance was a broad stained glass panel showing a knight in dark armor rescuing a lady who was tied to a tree and didn't have any clothes on but some very long and convenient hair. The knight had pushed the visor of his helmet back to be sociable, and he was fiddling with the knots on the ropes that tied the lady to the tree and not getting anywhere. I stood there and thought that if I lived in the house I would sooner or later have to climb up there and help him. He didn't seem to be really trying. Hello. Hello. Tall, aren't you? I didn't mean to be. <laughs> Handsome, too. And I bet you know it. What's your name? Riley. Doghouse Riley. <laughs> That's a funny name. Are you a prize fighter? Not exactly. I'm a sleuth. Uh-huh. You're making fun of me. Uh-huh. What? Get on with you. You heard me. Hmm, you're just a big tease. <laughs> you're awfully tall. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Whoops-a-daisy. <laughs> you want to watch that. One day some guy will drop you and you'll end up on the floor. Oh, you got me. <laughs> you're cute. I'm cute, too. <clears throat> the general will see you now, Mr. Marlowe. Let me put this down somewhere first. <clears throat> Who was that? Miss Carmen Sternwood, sir. You ought to wean her. She looks old enough. We went along a path that skirted a lawn. On the far side was a garage. A boyish-looking chauffeur was polishing a big black and chrome sedan. The path took us to the side of a greenhouse. In the middle of the jungle, in a space of hexagonal flags, an old Turkish rug was laid down, and on the rug was a wheelchair, and in the wheelchair an old and obviously dying man. This is Mr. Marlowe, General. You may take your coat off, sir. It's too hot in here for a man with blood in his veins. Do you like orchids? Not particularly. They are nasty things. You may smoke, sir. I like the smell of tobacco. A nice state of affairs when a man has to indulge his vices by proxy. Tell me about yourself, Mr. Marlow. I suppose I have a right to ask. Sure. I went to college once and can still speak English if there's any demand for it. I worked for a Mr. Wilde, the district attorney, as an investigator. His chief investigator, a man named Bernie Oles, called me and told me you wanted to see me. What did they tell about me? You're a widower. You have two young daughters, both pretty and both wild. One of them has been married three times, the last time to an ex-bootlegger named Rusty Regan. That's all I heard, General. Did any of it strike you as peculiar? I always got along with bootleggers myself. It seems I do, too. I'm very fond of Rusty. He was the breath of life to me. He spent hours in here, sweating like a pig, drinking my brandy, and telling me stories of Clonmel and the Irish Revolution. What happened to him? He went away a month ago, without a word to anyone. That hurt a little, but he was raised in a rough school. I'll hear from him one of these days. Meanwhile, I'm being blackmailed again. Again? A few months before Regan came, nine or ten months ago, I paid a man named Joe Brody $5,000 to let my younger daughter come and alone. Oh. Now, look at this. <clears throat> Mr. Arthur Gwynn Geiger, Rare Books and Deluxe Editions. Dear sir, in spite of the legal uncollectability of the enclosed, which frankly represent gambling debts, I assume you wish them honored. 
Respectfully, A.G. Geiger. $3,000. What does Carmen say? I haven't asked her. She would just suck her thumb and look caught. She did that to me. Then she tried to sit in my lap. I can take this Geiger off your back, General, if that's what you want. He'll think a bridge fell on him. The General has instructed me to give you a check for whatever seems desirable. Mrs. Regan would like to see you before you leave, sir. I was obliged to tell her who you were. I don't like that. Are you attempting to tell me my duties, sir? No, but I'm having a lot of fun trying to guess what they are. This way, please, sir. Do sit down, Mr. Marlowe. I sat down on the edge of a deep, soft chair and looked at Mrs. Regan. She was worth a stare. She was trouble. So, you're a private detective. I didn't know they really existed except in books. Or else they were greasy little men snooping around hotels. There was nothing in that for me, so I let it drift with the current. How'd you like Dad? I liked him. He liked Rusty. I suppose you know who Rusty is? Uh-huh. He's your husband. He shouldn't have gone off like that. Dad feels very badly about it, although he won't say so. Or did he? Uh-huh. You're not much of a gusher, Mr. Marlowe, are you? How will you go about it? Go about what? I don't see what there is to be cagey about. And I don't like your manners. I'm not crazy about yours. I don't mind if you don't like my manners. They're pretty bad. I grieve over them during the long winter evenings. But don't waste your time trying to cross-examine me. People don't talk to me like that. Just what is it you're afraid of, Mrs. Regan? That wasn't what he wanted with you at all, was it? To find my husband. Better ask him. Get out! Damn you, get out! <sighs> They were a couple of smooth citizens, she and her father. She had nice legs. He was probably just trying me out. The job he'd given me about this blackmailing Geiger was a lawyer's job, unless there was more to it than met the eye. I'd heard of Geiger. I knew he was a small-time pornographer and that his rare and deluxe editions were smut. I sat outside his shop. It was getting dark by the time he came out. I followed him home. It was pitch black by then. While I waited, a car drew up and a woman got out and went into the house. I waited some more. Then I went over and checked the car. The license holder read, Carmen Sternwood, 3765 Altebrea Crescent. As I got to the front door, someone came out of the back, running. Then nothing. The house was silent. There wasn't any hurry. What was in there was in there. I kicked the French window in, climbed through and pulled the drapes off my face. Neither of the two people in the room paid any attention to me, although only one of them was dead. <laughs> Carmen Sternwood was sitting on a high-backed chair at one end of the room. She was wearing a pair of long jade earrings. She wasn't wearing anything else. Geiger was on his back on the floor, in front of a camera. He was very dead. Come on. Let's be nice. hell. <laughs> What's this? Ether? Laudanum? Better hell. Let's get you dressed. <laughs> You're cute. Let's take a walk. Let's take a nice little walk. I got as many clothes on her as I could and stuffed the rest into my pockets. You're so cute. Come and lie down. I checked the camera. The plate holder was gone. I didn't like this development. I checked the desk. There was nothing in it but a blue leather notebook with a lot of writing in code. So cute. I wiped everything I had touched, carried Miss Sternwood out to her car, 
I went off down the hill without lights. I dumped Carmen and her Packard on the butler. He didn't seem too surprised. I made it back to Geiger's in half an hour of nimble walking. There was nobody there, and the body was gone. That froze me. Everything was exactly as it had been, but there were two parallel grooves in the rug pointing to the front door, as though heels had been dragged. Whoever had done it had meant business. Dead men are heavier than broken hearts. It was all right with me if someone wanted Geiger to be missing instead of murdered. It gave me a chance to find out if I could tell it to the cops and leave Carmen Sternwood out. I locked up again, went home, and sat around drinking too much liquor and trying to crack the code in Geiger's notebook. seen General Sternwood yet? Uh-huh. They seem to be a family things happen to. <clears throat> Big Buick belonging to one of them was washing about in the surf off Lido Fish Pier this morning. Anyone in it? The chauffeur, Owen Taylor. Murder or suicide? He'd been sat before he went in the water. Doc couldn't say how long before. I gotta go up to Sternwood place now. Leave the old man out if you can. He has enough troubles. You mean Rusty Regan? Are you looking... I don't know anything about Regan. I'm not looking for Regan. Hello there. Mr. Geiger in today? I'm afraid not. Can I help you? I've got something he'll want. Oh, a salesman. Come back tomorrow. I could go up the house. No, no, he's out of town. Come back tomorrow. The door at the back of the store opened, and I caught a glimpse of boxes lined with newspapers. A tall, dark, handsome boy looked out, saw me, and shut the door again. Tomorrow it is, then. I'd like to give you a card, but you know how it is. Yes. I drove down the alley behind the store. A small black truck was loading. After a while, it backed out and set off. I tailed it all the way over to Weston. It ducked into the basement garage of an apartment building on Randall Place. I parked and went down into the basement. Watch the weight, bud. She's only tested for half a ton. Where's the stuff going? Uh... Brody, 405. Uh, you and the manager? Yeah. Looks like a nice lot of loot. Yeah, uh, books. 100 pounds a box easy, and me with a 75-pound back. Oh, yeah. Brody. Books, huh? Yeah. Well, watch the weight. So Brody had the smut books. This must be the same Brody who blackmailed the general. I went back to my office. I always left the reception unlocked in case I had a client and the client cared to wait. I had a client. It was Carmen's big sister, Mrs. Vivian Regan. She was still worth staring at. You don't put up much of a front. You can't make much money at this trade if you're honest. Oh, are you honest? However did you get into this slimy business then? How did you come to marry a bootlegger? Oh my God, let's not start quarreling again. I've been trying to get you on the phone all morning. About Owen. So you know about that. Poor Owen. He was in love with Carmen, you know? She treated him like a dog. You better look at these. They came this morning. <clears throat> My sister has a beautiful little body, hasn't she? I was just admiring the earrings. How much do they want for the negative? Five thousand. Or it goes to a scandal sheet. A woman telephoned me. What else? Does there have to be something else? Yes. The woman said there was a police jam connected with it, and I better lay it on the line or I'd be talking to my little sister through a wire screen. Were you around last night? I was down at Eddie Marr's Cypress Club playing roulette. 
Can you get 5,000 in cash? Not unless I tell Dad. Lost my shirt. In fact, I could borrow it from Eddie Morris. He ought to be generous, heaven knows. Can you do anything? I think I can. But I can't tell you why or how. <laughs> I like you. You believe in miracles. Would you have a drink in the office? Thank you. There's another reason why Eddie Mars should be nice to me, which you may not know. Eddie's wife is the lady my husband ran away with. That doesn't interest you? Should it? You're the hardest guy to get anything out of. You don't even move your ears. <sighs> you better give me back the photos. Clothes or no clothes, your sister's just the dope. You don't like her body. You ought to see mine. Can it be arranged? You're as cold-blooded a beast as I ever met, Marlo. Can I call you Phil? Sure. You can call me Vivian. Thanks, Mrs. Regan. Oh, go to hell. I drove past the front of Geiger's house, slowly, gnawing at an idea. I hadn't looked in the garage the night before. Once Geiger's body had so conveniently slipped away, I hadn't really wanted to find it. But I didn't get the chance now. As I drew level, a woman in a small button hat on soft blonde hair stepped out from behind the hedge and stood looking wild-eyed at my car. It was Carmen Sternwood. Of course. Hello. Hello. What? What? Remember me? Doghouse Riley, the man who grew too tall. Oh. Let's go in. What? No. What are you doing here? How much do you remember of last night? I was sick last night. I was home. Before you went home. In that chair. Are you the police? No. Who killed him? Who else knows? Who killed him? Killed who? Don't get clever, for God's sake. <laughs> Your name is Riley. You're a private detective, my sister told me. You've come back to look for the photo, haven't you? It's gone. Maybe Brody's got it. You know Brody? Oh, I hate him. Don't give it another thought. Just don't tell anyone you were here. Leave it to Riley. Your name isn't... Oh, I have to go home now. Sure. What? Keep quiet. Excuse me. The bell didn't seem to rouse anybody. Is Mr. Geiger around? No. We don't know where he is. Friends of his? We just dropped by for a book. I'd like to talk to you, little soldier. We'll trot along. I got two boys in the car. I always do just what I want. The girl can dust. Oh. I'm going to go now. There's something wrong around here. I'm gonna find out what it is. Well, well. A tough guy. Only when necessary, soldier. Blood. Blood on the floor here. Quite a lot of blood. Old blood. Dried blood. Just who the hell are you, soldier? Marlowe's the name. Private investigator. Who's the girl? The client. What are you doing here? Geiger was trying to throw a loop with some kind of blackmail. We came to talk it over. What are you doing here? I own this house. Geiger is my tenant. You know such lovely people. <laughs> got any good ideas, soldier? Somebody gunned Geiger, or somebody got gunned by Geiger. Or he had chicken for dinner and liked to kill his chickens in the front parlor. I don't get your game here. Maybe it just isn't your day. I know you, Mr. Mars. The Cypress Club at Las Alindas. Flash gambling for flash people, the local law in your pocket, and the well grease line into L.A. You've got protection. Geiger was in a racket that needed that. Oh, yeah? But somebody got to him. He didn't show at the store today. They don't know where he is. I find blood on the floor. And you? You missed a little something. Somebody moved his books out of his store today. You seem to get around. 
How do you figure it? I think Geiger was rubbed. I think that's his blood. Somebody is taking over the racket and wants a little time to organize. That gives a motive for hiding the body. They can't get away with it. Who says so? This is a big town now, Eddie. You talk too damn much. Whoever got the books knows what's what. And I have a guess who got the books. Who? Not ready to talk, Eddie. Why should I? This. Oh, that. Or, I might make it worth your while. Whatever you know about all this is under glass, or there'd be a flock of John squeaking soul leather around this dump. My guess is, you need a little protection yourself. So cough up. You're right. If anything has happened to Geiger, I'll have to give what I have to the law. That doesn't leave me anything to give you. So, with your permission, I'll just drift. By the way, how's Mrs. Mars these days? Beat it. I don't give a damn where you go, but leave me out of your plans or you wish your name was Murphy and you lived in Limerick. Not Clomel. I hear you had a pal from there. Beat it. I got into my car and drove away. Nobody shot at me. Nobody followed me. I drove back into Hollywood and parked near the entrance of the apartment house on Randall Place and went up to 405. You're Joe Brody? So what? You got the books. I got the sucker list, Joe. We ought to talk. Why not? Grab some air. Such a lot of guns around town and so few brains. Here's the second guy I've met today who seems to think a gat in the hand means the world by the tail. The other guy's name is Eddie Mars. Ever heard of him, Joe? No. If he ever gets wise to where you were last night, he'll wipe you off. What would I be to Eddie Mars? Not even a memory. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a tough guy, just careful. I don't know Hell's first whisper about you. You could be a life taker. Why don't you have your friend in the open-toed shoes come out from behind the curtain? She's getting tired of holding her breath. Come on out, Agnes. I knew you were trouble when you came in the store. Put some light on so I can see to pop this guy if it works out that way. What's your story? Geiger's sucker list is in code. I haven't cracked it yet. There are about 500 names. Must be as many books. If each name reads each book, a dollar a rental, that's 500 times $500, and you still have your capital. Say, split it 50-50? Oh, you're crazy. Pipe down, for Christ's sake, Agnes. Joe! Pipe down! It's no racket for bums. It takes a smooth worker like you, Joe. Who has this lovely racket? You have, almost. Get rid of him, Joe. You shot Geiger to get it. The trouble is, he wasn't alone when you whiffed him. You take chances, mister. It's kind of goddamn lucky for you that I didn't pop guy. You can step off for it just the same. How come? There's somebody who'll tell it that way. I told you there was a witness. That goddamn little hot pants. She would. Swell. So, you got the photos of her? What photos? You were either there last night or you got the nude photo from somebody that was. You know, she was there because you had your girlfriend here threaten Mrs. Regan with a police rap. The only ways you could know enough to do that would be by seeing what happened or holding the photo. Cough up and be sensible. So she says I gunned him. Carmen Stern would hate my guts. We had a thing, but I bounced her out. She's too screwy. Hey, how about a little dough? I'm down at Nichols. Not from my club. Listen. Get the pictures, Brody. Oh, hell, you win. No. I only... Sit next to him. Hold your gun on him low down, away from the door. We ain't late yet, baby. Oh, Joe. Careful where you point that thing, Agnes. Yeah? I want my pictures, Joe. Hey, Carmen <laughs> Shaw, put the gun down, kid. I want my pictures. Agnes turns the gun away from me and swings it at Carmen. I reach out and close my fingers down over her hand and take the gun. She ducks her head and sinks her teeth into my thumb. I want my pictures! Listen, kid! Agnes spits at me and tries to bite my leg. I crack her on the head with a gun and try to stand up. 
She wraps her arms around my legs. Brody grabs for Carmen's gun and misses. The bullet breaks the glass in the window. Brody ducks down and jerks Carmen's feet from under her. A little revolver goes skidding off. Brody gets up on his knees and reaches for his pocket. I hit Agnes on the head with less delicacy than before. Stay where you are, Joe. Christ, don't let her kill me! Agnes is sitting up with her mouth open and a wick of metallic blonde hair down over her right eye. Carmen is crawling on her hands and knees towards a little revolver. Stay put, you're all right. I got a gun. Get up, Angel, you look like a Pekingese. I take the cult out of Brody's pocket. I've got all the guns now. The photos, Brody, give. Here, here, take them! These all? Uh-huh. Give them to me. I'll take care of them. You go home. Home? <laughs> go on and wait for me. <laughs> You're so cute. <laughs> what you see is nothing. I got a Balinese dancing girl tattooed on my right thigh. Can I have my gun? Later. <laughs> I like you. I like you a lot. <laughs> Satisfied? Why'd you put the bite on Mrs. Regan instead of the old man? Tapped him once already. What made you think she wouldn't tell him? I figure maybe she has a couple of soft spots she don't want the old man to know about. How'd you come by the photo? You got what you came after. I'm clean now. I don't know nothing about any photo, do I, Agnes? A half-smart guy. <laughs> That's all I ever draw. Never once a guy who's smart all the way around the course. <laughs> Never once. Did I hurt your head much? You and every other man I ever met. You ain't got nothing on me. Take the air. You ain't got nothing on me. Just a couple of murders. Oh, Joe. What's that mean? Where were you last night, Joe? I was watching a guy. A guy who had a nice racket I figured he needed a partner in. Geiger. Sure, Geiger. I was watching him now and then to see if he had any tough connections. You didn't watch hard enough. I'm there last night on the street below Geiger's house. It's raining. There's a car in front of Geiger's and another car a little way up the hill. That's why I stay down below. There's a big Buick parked down where I am. It's registered to Vivian Regan. Nothing happens, so I scram. Know where that Buick is now? Why would I? In the sheriff's garage. It was lifted out of 12 feet of water off Lido Fish Pier this morning. The chauffeur was in it, Owen Taylor. He'd been sapped. Jesus, guy. You can't pin that one on me. Why not? Owen Taylor went over to Geiger's to have a few words with him. He was sweet on Carmen, and he didn't like the kind of games Geiger was playing with her. He caught Geiger taking a photo of Carmen without any clothes on. So his gun went off, as guns will, and Geiger fell down dead. And Owen ran away, but not without the negative Geiger had just taken. So how did you get hold of it? I saw Owen come out. I took off after him. At the bottom of the canyon, he skidded off the road. I came up and played copper. He went for the gun, but I sapped him. I lifted the plate holder just out of curiosity. He came out of it all of a sudden, knocked me off the car, and drove away. He was out of sight by the time I picked myself up. How did you know it was Geiger he shot? <sighs> when Geiger didn't come to the store this morning, I was pretty damn sure. So I figure it's a good time to move his books out. Where did you hide Geiger's body? Nick, scarephead. Somebody hit the body. You think I'd go back there and... She's back again. If she is, she doesn't have her gun. Don't you have any other friends? Yeah? Brody? Yeah. Why'd you... I jump over Brody's body and run down the hall and race the elevator down to the lobby. By the time I get outside, a tall hatless figure in a leather jerkin is running diagonally across the street between the parked cars. The figure turns. And it runs on. Hey! What happened? Shooting going on. Jesus! I got in my car, rode down a block and a half, stopped at the intersection. I double parked, slipped between two cars, went down low. I took Carmen's little revolver out of my pocket. It was the boy, the very handsome boy from Geiger's store. You got a match, buddy? You must have thought a lot of that, Queen. Go screw yourself. Me and the cops. Who are you? Friend of Geiger's. Go screw yourself. This is a small gun, kid. 
I'll give it you through the navel, and it'll take you three months to get well enough to walk. But you'll get well, so you can walk to the nice new gas chamber up in Quentin. What you want? You shot the wrong guy. Joe Brody didn't kill your queen. Go screw yourself. Get into my car, kid. You drive. The Geiger's place. Anybody home? You ought to know. How would I know? Go screw yourself! You don't want to fight. You're giving away too much weight. He wanted to fight. <laughs> Keep quiet. You'll get the same and more of it. Just lie quiet and hold your breath. Go screw yourself. You're gonna cop a plea, brother. Don't even think you're not. And you're gonna say just what we want you to say and nothing we don't want you to say. Go screw yourself. I left him lying on the floor and looked around. In the bedroom, there was a dim, flickering light. It came from two tall black candles standing on straight back chairs, one on either side of the bed. Geiger lay on the bed, his arms crossed at the wrists and his hands flat against his shoulders. His mouth was closed, and his broad nose was pinched and white. I didn't touch him. This is Marlowe. Yeah? Did you boys find a revolver on Owen Taylor this morning? They would come under the heading of police business? If they did, it had three empty shells in it. How the hell did you know that? Come over to Laverne Terrace, 7244. I'll show you what the slugs went into. Just like that, huh? Just like that. And he looked ready for a fight. Captain Cronjager, meet Philip Marlowe. A private eye is in a jam. Oh. Shoot. Marlowe, I'll try to handle Captain Cron Jager, but you know how it is. This is a big city now. Uh-huh. What did you get on the Randall Place killing, Captain? A uh, staff, two slugs on him, named Brody. A blonde who was in there when he got it claimed she didn't see the killer. That all? It only happened an hour ago. What did you expect? Maybe a description of the killer? Tall guy in a leather jerkin. He's outside. Marlowe put the arm on him for you. Here's his gun. <laughs> There's a couple more deaths involved. What? A car came out of the ocean this morning with a dead guy in it. The guy was chauffeur to a family. The family was being blackmailed. I recommended Marlow to the family. Marlow played it kind of close to the waistcoat. I love private dicks who do that. Give it to him, Marlow. I gave it to him. I left out two things. I left out Carmen's visit to Brody's apartment and Eddie Mars's visit to Geiger's. I told the rest of it just as it happened. So all you did was not report a murder that happened last night, and then spend today foxing around so this kid of Geiger's could commit a second murder this evening. That's all. I hadn't any reason to think the boy would go gunning for Brody. That kind of thinking is police business. If Geiger's death had been reported last night, the books could never have been moved, and the kid wouldn't have been let to Brody and wouldn't have killed him. A life's a life, Marlowe. Tell that to your coppers the next time they shoot down some scared, petty crook running away up an alley. What? That's enough of that. Marlowe, what makes you so sure that Owen Taylor shot Geiger? Taylor had the motive, jealousy, and the opportunity. He killed Geiger in front of Carmen Sternwood. I can't see anyone with a purely commercial interest doing that. But... But Taylor would have done it. The nude photo of Carmen was just what would have made him do it. Um, what's this business about hiding Geiger's body? The kid must have done it. Why? When he came home, he found the body. He probably thought it was a good idea to hide it in the garage while he got his own effects out of the house. But then... Later on, he had a revulsion of feeling and thought he hadn't treated his dead friend very nicely. So he went back and laid him out in the bed. Then he goes down to the store and finds out that Brody's taken the books and figures him for the killer. Sure. We'll find out. But that doesn't help Captain Cronjager's troubles. All this happened last night, and he's only just been rung in on it. I think I can find some way to deal with that angle. So, the note that Geiger sent to General Sternward, I guess that was just a come-on. 
If the general had paid him, it would have been through fear of something worse. And Geiger would have tightened screws. Do you know what the general was afraid of, Marla? I've left out a couple of personal matters. <laughs> My client's entitled to some protection. Captain Kronjager has two murders on his hands, both solved. We have both killers. The blackmail angle has got to be suppressed. The Hollywood Police Division are good at suppressing things. Okay. They allowed Geiger to operate a smut business in broad day. I dare say they had their reasons. Okay. Captain. That's okay. We're glad to stooge for a Seamus of his standing. Thank you, Captain. You ought to understand, Marlow, how any officer would feel about a cover-up like this. But I think it may be possible to keep General Sturmage's name out. Do you know why I'm not tearing your ear off? No. What are you getting for it all? Twenty-five dollars a day, plus expenses. And for that, you're willing to get yourself in Dutch with half the law enforcement of this country? What the hell am I to do? I'm on a case. I'm selling what I have to sell to make a living. Cops get very large and emphatic when an outsider tries to cover anything up, but they do it themselves every other day. And I'm not through. I'm still on the case. I'd do the same thing again if I had to. Providing Kronjager doesn't get your license. Let me tell you something, son. My father was a friend of the General's. I've done all I can to save the old man from grief, but in the end, it can't be done. Those girls of his ought not to be running around loose. And there's another thing. I'll bet a dollar to a Canadian dime that the General's afraid his son-in-law is mixed up in this, and what he really hopes you'd find out is that he isn't. Rusty Regan didn't sound like a blackmailer, what I heard him. Did the General tell you he was looking for Regan? He told me he wished he knew where he was. That's all. It was late by the time I got home. I took Carmen's little gun out of my pocket and cleaned it and locked it up. Then I made myself a drink. Marlo? Eddie Mars. What can I do for you? Cops over at Geiger's place. You keep me out of it. Why should I? I'm nice to be nice to, soldier. I'm not nice to be not nice to. Listen hard and you'll hear my teeth chattering. Did you? What? Keep me out of it. As it happens, I did. Thanks, soldier. Know who gunned him? Reading the paper tomorrow. I want to know now. Do you get everything you want? Somebody you never heard of. Let it go at that. If that's on the level, soldier, someday I may be able to do you a real favor. Then hang up and let me go to bed. You're looking for Rusty Regan. A lot of people seem to think I am, but I'm not. Drop in and see me. Down at the club sometime. Maybe. Remember me? Yes, Mr. Marlowe. I remember you, of course. Give Mrs. Regan a message, will you? Tell her I have the pictures, all of them, and that everything is all right. You have the pictures and everything is all right. Yes, sir. I may say thank you very much, sir. Five minutes later, the phone rang. I let it ring and went to bed. I had a belly full of the Sternwood family. I read the papers next morning over my eggs and bacon. It was a nice write-up. Captain Kronjager got all the credit for solving the two slayings in his district. According to the report, Brody had shot Geiger, and a kid had shot Brody in revenge and confessed. The suicide of Owen Taylor made the inside pages. There will be no inquest. 
Captain Gregory of the Missing Persons Bureau studied my card with his head on one side. Private Dick, eh? What can I do for you? I'm working for General Sternwood. On what? Not exactly what you're working on, but I thought you could help me. On what? General Sternwood's a rich man. If he wants to hire a full-time boy to run errands for him, that's no reflection on the police. Regan? Sure. I'm told he disappeared about a month back. Brother, I'd like to help you, but I don't know where he is. Regan. Regan. Uh, ah. He blew on the 16th of September. We found the car four days later. Uh, there's an angle to that. I was near an apartment belonging to Annie Mars' wife. Huh. You know. Uh, yeah. She left about the same time Regan did. She and Eddie didn't live together, but they were friendly, Eddie says. She was a blonde then, but she won't be now. We don't find her car, so they probably left in it. I don't see nothing to do but wait. They'll run out of dough someday. They've got new names, but they've got the same old appetites. What did the girl do before she married Annie Mars? A singer. Photo? Not here. We'll find them. Could take a year or two. General Stormwood may not live that long. We've done all we could, brother. You think maybe Eddie put them both down? No. I think that Regan ran away with a woman who meant more to him than a rich wife he didn't get along with. You met her? Vivian Regan? Yeah. She made for a jazzy weekend, but she'd be wearing for a steady diet. A gray Plymouth sedan tailed me away from the city hall. I gave it a chance to catch up with me on a quiet street. It refused the offer, so I shook it off and went back to my office and sat in my swivel chair and tried to catch up on my foot dangling. I counted it up on my fingers. Rusty Regan had run away from a lot of money and a handsome wife to go wandering with a vague blonde who was more or less married to a racketeer named Eddie Mars. Geiger was dead, and Carmen would have to find some other shady character to drink exotic blends of hooch with. I didn't suppose she would have any trouble. Mrs. Regan knew Eddie Mars well enough to borrow money off him. Geiger's pretty boy was out of circulation for a long, long time. Agnes was in custody as a material witness. That left me and I was paid off. The smart thing for me to do was take another drink and forget the whole mess. So I called Eddie Mars and told him I was coming down to Las Alindas. That's how smart I was. This is my office. Come on in, have a drink. You hinted you had something for me? Watch your hurry. Have a drink and sit down. You and me haven't got anything to talk about the business. You'll have a drink and like it. Ever been here before? I don't get my kicks out of gambling. You ought to look in tonight. One of your friends is outside betting the wheels. I hear she's doing pretty well. Vivian Regan. You have some information about her husband? You're not really interested in Regan, are you? Not professionally. But I know somebody who would like to know where he is. She doesn't give a damn. I mean her father. Huh? Geiger was trying to blackmail the general. The general wouldn't say so, but I figure he was at least half scared that Regan might be behind it. It was just Geiger you're after. You washed up on that angle. Washed up and paid off. <laughs> I wish old Sternwood would hire himself a soldier like you in a straight salary. Keep those girls at his home a few nights in a week. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, they're plain trouble. The dark ones are pain in the neck around here. If she loses, she plunges, and I end up with a fistful of papers. She has no money of her own except an allowance. If she wins, she takes my money home with her. You get it back the next night. In time. I'm the loser. I'm going out to look the joint over. Okay, soldier. Maybe I can do you a real favor someday. You got it all from Captain Gregory this time. So you own a piece of him, too. We're just friends. You don't have anybody tailing me in a gray Plymouth sedan, do you? Hell no. Why should I? I couldn't imagine. His surprise looked genuine enough. But why was this stuff about Vivian Regan so important? I wondered why he thought it was necessary to tell me at all. Mr. Mars says drink on the house. Uh-huh. 
She's picking him tonight. Right on the nose. That tall, dark-haired frail. Who is she? She comes here a lot. I wouldn't know her name. The hell you wouldn't. I just work here, mister. She's all alone, too. That guy was with her, passed out. They took him out to his car. Maybe I'll take her home. <laughs> hell you will. Two scotch and soda? Sir. Boy, I never saw such a run. Yeah, plenty of soda. Eight wins and two stamps in a row in that bed. Mm, that's roulette, boy. <laughs> that's roulette. It gives me the itch. She's betting a grand a crack. She can't lose. <laughs> what kind of a cheap outfit is this? I beg your pardon, madame. Get busy and spin that wheel, high pockets. I want one more play, and I'm playing table stakes. You take it away fast enough, I've noticed, but when it comes to dishing it out, you start to whine. The table cannot cover your bed, madame. You have over $16,000 there. It's your money. Don't you want it back? Mr. Mars. What's the matter, Michelle? Ah, Mrs. Regan. Well, if you're not playing anymore, you must let me send someone home with you. One more play, Eddie. Everything I have on the red. I like red. It's the color of blood. Michelle. Mr. Mars. Cover her betting even thousands. No one objects to this turn of the wheel being just for the lady. <laughs> the red wins. <laughs> Can I get your car, sir? I'm just getting some air. Awful foggy, sir. If I get lost, I'll haul. You could see a scant dozen yards in the fog. I circled to the left and drifted back to the old stables where they parked the cars. There was someone there before me. I made him out. A vague shadow close to the path. He turned his head. His face should have been a white blur. It wasn't. There was a mask over it. I stepped behind a tree and crouched down. We both waited. <gasps> this is a gun lady. Oh. Gentle now. Sound carries in the fog. Make a noise and I'll cut you in half. Just hand me the bag. Hi, oh, oh. soldier. You're covered. Put the bag down. Slow and easy. Now the gun. Now beat it. On your way, soldier. No hard feelings. You keep it quiet and I'll keep it quiet, okay? Okay. People keep giving me guns. Here, this is your bag, I believe. Nice work, Marlo. Are you my bodyguard now? Looks that way. What are you doing here? Eddie Moss wanted to see me. Why? He thought I was looking for somebody he thought had run away with his wife. Were you? No. And what'd you come for? To find out why he thought I was looking for somebody he thought had run away with his wife. Did you find out? No. I thought you weren't interested in that. People keep throwing it at me. Take me to the garage. I ought to look in at my escort. My boyfriend's still blotto. I'm afraid he is, miss. He's on the back seat to put a rug over him. Meet my escort, Mr. Larry Cobb. You should see him sober. I should see him sober. Somebody should see him sober, just for the record. Yeah? <laughs> I even thought of marrying him at odd times when nothing pleasant would come into my mind. Is lots of money. A, a yacht. A place on Long Island, a place at Bermuda. Yeah? Does he have a driver to take him home? I don't say yeah, it's common. Undoubtedly a whole platoon of drivers. They probably do squads right in front of the garage every morning. Buttons gleaming, white gloves immaculate, a sort of West Point elegance about them. He drove himself tonight. I could call his home and have somebody come down for him. Oh, that would be lovely. Would you do that? He'll take care of him, I'm sure. Oh, jeez. Oh, I sure will, miss. Thanks. Thanks, miss. 
Let's ride in your car. Sure. It's outside on the street. Quite all right with me, Marlo. I love a nice walk in the fog. You meet such interesting people. You better have a drink. I could get drunk as two sailors and love it. I found a drugstore, bought a pint of rye at the liquor counter, and carried it over to the stools. Two coffees, black and strong. You can't drink liquor, me. Marlo, you want a cigarette? It's against the law to drink liquor in here. Thanks. Okay, I'll watch the street while you pull. My heart's in my mouth doing this. <laughs> you have wicked eyes. What's Eddie Mars got on you? I took plenty away from him tonight. You think he sent that Lugan after you? What's a Lugan? A guy with a gun. Are you a Lugan? <laughs> sure, but strictly speaking, a Lugan is on the wrong side of the fence. I often wonder if there is a wrong side. We're losing the subject. What has Eddie Mars got on you? You mean a hold on me of some sort? Yes. Whittier, please, Marlow. Much wittier. How's the general? I don't pretend to be witty. Not too good. How much does he know? Probably everything. The district attorney came out to see him. They're old friends. I know. Did you burn those pictures? Sure. You worry about your little sister, don't you? I worry about Dad, too. To keep things from him? He hasn't many illusions. Or where is blood? It was always wild, but it wasn't always rotten. I don't want him to die despising it. So... You're a gunman. A killer. Oh, nuts. One of those dark, deadly, quiet men who has no more feelings than a butcher has for slaughtered meat. I knew it the first time I saw you. You've got enough shady friends to know different. They're all soft compared to you. Thanks, lady. You're no English muffin yourself. Let's get out of this rotten little place. We drove through a series of little dank towns, with shack-like houses built down on the sand, close to the rumble of the surf. Drive down by the Delray Beach Club. I want to look at the water. Sure. Move closer. Hold me, you beast. Killer. Kiss me again, killer. Where do you live? Franklin, near Kenmore. I've never seen it. Want to? Yes. What has any Mars got on you? <laughs> so that's the way it is. Kissing is nice, but your father didn't hire me to sleep with you. You son of a bitch. Don't think I'm an icicle. You're easy to take. Too damned easy. What has Eddie Mars got on you? If you say that again, I'll scream. Go ahead and scream. Men have been shot for little things like that. Men have been shot for practically nothing. First time we met, I told you I was a detective. Get it through your lovely head. I work at it, lady. I don't play at it. What makes you think he has anything on me? He lets you win a lot of money and sends a gun poke around to take it back. You're not more than mildly surprised. If I wanted to flatter myself, I'd say it was at least partly for my benefit. Do I have to tell you that I loathe your guts, Mr. Detective? I like kissing you. You kept your head beautifully. Should I congratulate you or my father? I like kissing you. If I had a razor, I would cut your throat just to see what ran out of it. Take me home. I took her home. I got back to my apartment, but before I switched on the light, I knew something was wrong. Something in the air. A scent. 
Something across the floor that shouldn't have been there. Something on my bed. <laughs> I guess you can't even guess how I got in. He came in through the keyhole, just like Peter Pan. Who's he? <laughs> You're cute, aren't you? I'm all undressed. That's nice, but I've already seen it all, remember? I'm the guy that keeps finding you without any clothes on. Hmm. So how did you get in? The manager let me. I was... I was mysterious. Managers <laughs> are like that. Now, tell me how you're gonna go out. I like it here. Listen. Carmen. Doghouse appreciates all you're offering, but you and he have to keep on being friends, and this isn't the way to do it. Now, will you dress like a nice little girl? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm working for your father. He's a sick man. He sort of trusts me not to pull any stunts. Won't you please get dressed, Carmen? <laughs> your name isn't Doghouse Riley. It's Philip Marlowe. He can't fool me. <laughs> I'm gonna fix a drink. Want one? Uh huh. When you're dressed, you'll get it, okay? No. Now. When you're dressed. <laughs> Not until you're dressed. <laughs> get dressed! Are you queer? I'm drinking my drink. I'll give you three minutes to get dressed and get out of here, or I'll throw you out just the way you are, and I'll throw your clothes out after you. And get started. You must be queer. Should have known you were dirty queer. Dirty queer! Don't forget your shoes. I went over to the bed and looked down at it. The imprint of her head was still in the pillow. Of her small, corrupt body still on the sheets. I put my glass down and tore the bed to pieces. Savagely. It was raining again the next morning. I got up feeling sluggish and tired and stood looking out of the windows with a dark, harsh taste of the sternwood still in my mouth. Across the street, a hundred feet up, a gray Plymouth sedan was parked. Howdy, partner. I don't think I know you. I'm the guy you've been trying to follow around for a couple of days. I ain't following anybody, Doc. Okay, have it your own way. I'm going up to my office. If you have anything that's worrying you beyond endurance, drop up and chew it over. I'll only be oiling my machine gun. Twenty minutes later, I was at my desk admiring a large check for $500 signed by Guy de Brissy Sternwood when the buzzer went. Come in and shed your coat and sit down. Maybe you know me. I'm Harry Jones. Nope. I've been around. Used to do a little liquor running down from Wenemy Point. Tough racket. Terrible. Maybe you don't believe me. Maybe I haven't bothered to make my mind up either way. You've been following me around for a couple of days like a fellow trying to pick up a girl and lacking the last inch of nerve. Maybe you're selling insurance. Maybe... You know a fellow called Joe Brody. Christ, how'd you know that? I'm psychic. Shake your business up and pour it. I haven't got all day. I was trying to get a line on you, sure. I got something to sell. How'd you tie me to Joe? I was just guessing. You're not a cop. You don't belong to Eddie Mars. I asked him last night. Eddie Mars? Jesus, you're kidding me. All right, I'm just kidding. Agnes sent me. She's loose? You made a crack when you were up there. The night Joe Brody got squibbed off. Something about Brody must have known something good about the Sternwoods, or he wouldn't have taken a chance on the pictures he sent him. 
So he had. What was it? Two hundred bucks tells you. We gotta get out of town. Agnes is a nice girl. It's not so easy for a dame to get by these days. She's too big for you. She'll roll on you and smother you. That's kind of a dirty crack, brother. You're right, I'm sorry. I've been meeting the wrong kind of people lately. What do you got for the money? Would you pay it? If it does what? If it helps you find Rusty Regan. I'm not looking for Rusty Regan. Wanna hear it or not? Eddie Mars had Regan bumped off. Beat it. I'm not kidding. On your way, small size. I knew Rusty. Not well. A nice guy, though. He was sweet on a singer named Mona Grant. Then she changed her name to Mars. Rusty got sore and married a rich dame. You know all about her. This Rusty was a cockeyed sort of buzzard. He had long-range eyes. He was looking over into the next valley all the time. He wasn't scarcely around where he was. So he ran away. He started to run away, maybe. With this girl, Mona, who'd married Eddie Morse. She wasn't living with Eddie. She didn't like his rackets, especially the sidelines, the blackmail, the bent cars. The talk was Regan told Eddie one night, right out in the open, that if he ever messed up Mona in any criminal rap, he'd be around to see him. And then I hear a guy say that Mona lambed out with Rusty Regan and Morse is acting like best man instead of being sore. So I tell Joe Brody, and Joe's figuring, if he could get a line on where the two lovebirds went, he could collect twice. Once from Eddie Morse and once from Regan's wife. So Joe and me watch the papers, but we don't see anything. Then one day, I see Lash Canino in Vardy's. Know him? Nope. He does a job for Mars when Mars needs him. He'd bump off a guy between drinks, but he only comes to L.A. when he's needed. So maybe they got a line on Regan, and maybe he's needed. Anyway, I tell Joe, and Joe tails Canino out to the Sternwood place. A canino parks outside, and a girl comes out. It's Regan's wife. And they talk, and she hands something over. So Joe figures Canino knows something, and is trying to squeeze a little on the side. And? Without some dough, that's all. I don't see it. Would you give the 200 to know where Eddie's wife is? Even if she was alone? Even if she never ran away with Regan at all and was being kept about 40 miles from L.A. so the law would keep on thinking she had dusted with him? Would you pay 200 bucks for that, Seamus? I think I would. Where? Agnes Sora. Just by a lucky break, managed to tailor home. Agnes will tell you where. You bring the money, I'll take you to Agnes. Come over to the full wider building. 428 at the back, after dark. The fourth floor of the full wider building had a frayed mat and a tarnished spittoon, mustard walls and a memory of low tide. I went down the line and turned a corner. On a dark glass door with the numbers 428, a second door beyond showed light, and from the open transom above, came the voice of Harry Jones. Canino, yeah, I seen you around somewhere, sure. I thought you would. I tried the darkened door, opened it softly, and hung motionless like a lazy fish in the water. A fan of light spread from an inch of the opening of the connecting door into the lighted office. So you go to see this peeper. Well, that was your mistake. Eddie don't like it. The peeper told Eddie some guy in a gray Plymouth was tailing him. Eddie naturally wants to know who and why, see? You know why I went to the peeper. I of Joe Brody's girl. She has to blow. She figures the peeper can get us some dough. Dough for what? Brody was trying to peddle a nude photo with a young Sternwood girl. Marlow got wise to him. While they were arguing about it, the young Sternwood girl dropped around with a gat and took a shot at Brody. The peeper didn't tell the coppers about that, and Agnes didn't either. She figures it's railway fair for her not to. Where's this Agnes at? Nothing doing. You'll tell me, little man, here or in the back room. She's my girl now, Canino. I don't put my girl in the middle for nobody. How much you tap the peeper for? Two centuries. Get it? I'm seeing him tomorrow. I have hopes. Where's Agnes? Listen. Where's Agnes? Look at it, little man. I'm looking at it. 
Go ahead and blast me and see what I get you. Where's Agnes? <laughs> okay. 28 Court Street, up on Bunker Hill, apartment 301. I guess I'm yellow, all right. You got good sense. If it's the way you say it is, everything is jake -a No hard feelings? No, no hard feelings. Fine, let's step the bill. We got a glass, this is Bond stuff. <laughs> Moths in your ermine, as the ladies say. Success. <laughs> You ain't sick from just one drink, are you, pal? <coughs> so long, little man. I stirred around the edge of the door and looked in. Harry Jones sat upright against the back of the chair, eyes wide. Behind the charred smell of the bourbon was the scent of bitter almonds. That made it cyanide. Hello? Is Harry around? Not for a minute, Agnes. Who's talking? Marlo. Agnes, are you at Bunker Hill? 28 Court Street? No. Why should I be? Okay. I didn't think you were. Where's Harry? I came over to give him 200 bucks in return for certain information. The offer holds. I have the money. Where are you? Didn't he tell you? No. Do you want the two C's or not? I want it pretty bad. Then tell me where to bring it. I'll meet you in half an hour. Bullock's Wilshire. East entrance to the parking lot. Give me the money. Here. What happened to Harry? He ran away. Canino got wise to him somehow. Canino? Forget Harry. I want my information. Joe and I were out riding Foothill Boulevard Sunday before last. We passed a brown coupe, and I saw the girl who was driving it. There was a man beside her. She was Eddie Mars's wife. The guy was Canino. Joe tailed them to the foothills a mile east of Rialito. Just off the highway, there's a garage and a paint shop run by a guy named Art Huck. Hot car drop, likely. There's a frame house behind it. That's where she's holed up. Sure you knew her? If you ever see her, you won't make a mistake the second time. Goodbye, copper. Wish me luck. I got a raw deal. Like hell you did. I drove north in the rain. Fate stage managed the whole thing. Just about a mile beyond Rialito, I went too close to the shoulder and my right front tire let go. Then the right rear went with it. I got out and flashed a spotlight. The flat butt of a heavy tack stared at me from the front tire. The edge of the pavement was littered with them. There was a light up a side road. It seemed to come from a skylight. The skylight could belong to a garage. The garage could be run by a man named Art Huck. Open up! What you want? I got two flats back on the highway. We're closed. Wise guy, eh? Huh? Open up, Art. Kill that spot. Folks get hurt that way. Step inside, stranger. We'll see what we can do. Ain't you got no sense? A bank job was pulled in Rialito this noon. Yeah? Well, I didn't pull it. Some say it was a couple of punk kids. They got cornered back here in the hills. I suppose they threw tax out. I got some of them. Don't you want the business? You didn't ever get socked in a kisser, did you? Not by anybody your way. The guy's in a jam, Art. You run a garage, don't you? 
I got this spray job. Too damn for a good spray job, Art. Get moving. Front and rear on the right side. You could use the spare for one if you're busy. You're gonna need two jacks, Art. Teach me my job. I bet you could use a drink. Uh-huh. That Art. He's like all mechanics. Always got his face in a job he ought to have done last week. He is moths in your ermine, as the ladies say. Uh-huh. I rolled it around my tongue. No cyanide. I walked over to a half-painted sedan, the paint gun lying on its fender. Just a panel job to start with. But the guy had dough, and his driver needed a few bucks. You know the racket. There's only one that's older. I lit a cigarette. The minutes passed on tiptoe. He and I were two strangers, chance met, looking at each other across a little dead man named Harry Jones. Only he didn't know it yet. He took a roll of nickels out of his pocket and tossed it up and down on the palm of his hand. You sure pick spots for a jack to stand on. Don't crab so much. Fix those flats. I'm fixing them, ain't I? Hud put a tire on the spreader and tore the tube out. The teamwork must have been very nice. I saw no signal. Art takes a quick step and slams down the tube over my head and shoulders. Canino comes almost dancing toward me across the floor. He comes up to me without expression. His fist goes through my spread hands like a stone through a cloud of dust. He hits me again. There's no sensation in my head. There's nothing but hard, aching white light. Then there's darkness, in which something red wiggles like a germ under a microscope. Then there's nothing. Then there was a woman, and she was sitting where she belonged in a good light. She was so platinum that her hair shone like a silver fruit bowl. I was on a Davenport, trussed like a turkey. Oh. Hello. How do you feel? Great. Somebody built a filling station on my jaw. Oh. What did you expect? Orchids? Just a plain pine box and don't scatter my ashes over the blue Pacific. I like worms better. Did you know that worms are of both sexes and that any worm can love any other worm? You're a little light-headed. Huh. I don't think you're so dangerous, Mr. Marlowe. Ah. They went through your pockets. So you're a detective. Is that all they have on me? What time is it? 10.17. <clears throat> you have a date? I wouldn't be surprised. Is this the house next to Art Huck's garage? Yes. What are the boys doing? Digging a grave? They had to go somewhere. You mean they left you here alone? I thought they were keeping you prisoner. What made you think that? I know who you are. Then I'm afraid you're in a bad spot. And I hate killing. And you Eddie Maz's wife. Shame on you. <clears throat> you might spare me a little of that drink you're neglecting. Your face looks like a collision mat. Make the most of it. It won't last long, even this good. Mm. Why did you come here and stick your neck out? Eddie wasn't doing you any harm. If I hadn't hid out here, the police would have been certain that Eddie murdered Rusty Regan. He did. Eddie didn't do anything to him. Eddie's not that sort of man. You think he's just a gambler. I think he's a pornographer, a blackmailer, a hot car broker, a killer by remote control. He's not a killer. He has Canino. Canino killed a man tonight, a harmless little man who was just trying to help somebody out. I heard him do it. I thought platinum hair was out of style. It's a wig, silly, while mine grows out. Cut mine off, see? Why? To show Eddie I was willing to do what he wanted me to do. I love him. Good grief. And you have me right here in the room with you. <laughs> You're a kick. I can get the ropes off. 
I can't do anything about the handcuffs. You can run. <sighs> Kidding with every breath? The spot you're in? I thought Eddie wasn't a killer. Lean forward, can you? You better go with me if you want to keep on living. Don't waste time. I'm not going. <sighs> there. Sorry I can't do anything about the cops. <sighs> Let a cigarette for me. Okay. Hello, Silverwig. Don't waste time. How long will you last after turning me loose? I'm not going. Kiss me, Silverwig. Please go. There's no hurry. All this was arranged in advance, timed with a split second, just like a radio program. No hurry at all. Kiss me. Please go. Kiss me again. I made it back to my car. Took my gun from the pocket under the wheel and started back. I flopped into a ditch as a car hummed by. When I reached the house, the car was parked and empty, the keys hanging in the dash. All I had to do was wait for him to come out. Canino! Hey! Canino! I got into the car and started it. Then I got out again and crouched behind the rear wheels. That did it. He needed that car. A darkened window slid down. Glass shattered in the coupe. I let out a scream. I let it die off gradually. It was nice work. I liked it. Canino liked it very much. The house door crawled open. Silverwig moved out onto the porch. Canino came crouched methodically behind her. It was so deadly, it was almost funny. I can't see a thing. The windows are misted. Get closer. Oh! I can see him. Through the window, he's behind the wheel. He fell for it like a bucket of lead. Finished. <laughs> I shot him four times. He leaned forward, holding himself together with his broad hands. Then he fell face down on the broad gravel. I was afraid you'd come back. I told you. We had a date. <laughs> Did you have to kill him? Yes. I suppose you did. I hear there's been some killing. Yes, General. The police through with you? For now. I didn't ask you to look for my son-in-law. You wanted me to, though. You assume a great deal. Is that what you wanted to see me about? I do want you to find Rusty. I'll pay you another thousand dollars to find him. He doesn't have to come back. I just want to know that he is all right, wherever he is. Am I clear? Yes, General. In the garden, I found Carmen sitting on a bench looking forlorn. Bored? You're not mad at me. I thought you were mad at me. I brought you back your gun. I cleaned it and loaded it for you. Take my tip. Don't shoot it at people unless you get to be a better shot. <laughs> Teach me to shoot. Teach me to shoot? I'd like that. Here. <laughs> it's against the law. I know where. Down by some of the old wells. 
We reached the place she meant in ten minutes. Half a dozen stained wooden derricks, a pile of rusted pipe, dusty eucalyptus, stagnant oil scummed water. The smell of that sump would poison a herd of goats. Take it easy now. It's loaded in all five. <laughs> Let's use that wheel. I'll put a can on it. <laughs> Don't start shooting until I get back beside you, okay? Okay. <laughs> Stand there, you son of a bitch! Stay there! <laughs> My, but you're cute. Even you could have hit at that range. But... why did... You're a callous brute. You killed a man, and now you have to come up here and frighten my kid sister into a fit? What'd you do to her? Took her down the old wells to teach her to shoot. It was her idea. She threw a wing ding. Looked like an epileptic fit to me. Yes. She has them once in a while. I guess you still don't want to tell me what Eddie Mars has on you. Nothing at all. It all ties together. Geiger and his cute blackmail tricks, Brody and his pictures, Eddie Mars and his roulette tables. Lash Canino and the girl Rusty Regan didn't run away with. It all ties together. I'm afraid I don't even know what you're talking about. Suppose you did. It would be something like this. Geiger got his hooks into your sister and tried to blackmail your father. Eddie Mars was behind Geiger, protecting him and using him. Your father sent for me to show he wasn't scared. Eddie knew that your sister was a killer, so he had something on you. But he wanted to know if he had it on the general, too. If the general knew about it, Eddie could put the fix on him and collect a lot of money in a hurry. If not, he'd have to wait until the general died and you got your share. Because Eddie knew where Egan had gone, and that your sister had killed him, and that he could collect a million on it. And naturally, he didn't want the police to find out. So Eddie sent his wife into hiding and set Canino to guard her, so that it would look as if she'd run away with Regan. Give me a cigarette. Am I boring you? By the way, here's Carmen's gun. It's empty. She emptied it at me for maybe five feet. Cute little thing, isn't she? Too bad I loaded it with blanks. You're a horrible man. I was thinking of the day Regan disappeared. I think he took her down to the wells to teach her to shoot. And she turned the gun and shot him. And for the same reason. I threw her out of my bed, you know. I guess he had to do the same, but you can't do that to Carmen. I suppose you want money. You went to Eddie Mars for help? Rusty's in the sump. The horrible, decayed thing. She came home and told me about it. She, she's not normal. I knew Eddie would bleed me white, but I had to have help. I could only get it from someone like him. Take her away somewhere. Get her cured if you can. It's been done. I'll give you three days, then out it comes. I don't know what to say to you. Just get out of here. Eddie. Forget Eddie. I'll handle Eddie. I went quickly away from her and down the room and out. I drove downtown. I stopped at a bar. I had a couple of double scotches. What did it matter where you lay once you were dead? In a dirty sump or in a marble tower, you were dead. You were sleeping the big sleep. You were not bothered by things like that. Oil and water were the same as wind and air to you. You just slept the big sleep, not caring about the nastiness of how you died or where you fell. Me, I was part of the nastiness now. But the old man didn't have to be. In a little while, he too, like Rusty Regan, would be sleeping the big sleep. <laughs> the 
The scotches didn't do me any good. All they did was make me think of Silverwig. And I never saw her again. The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler, dramatized by Robin Brooks. Philip Marlowe was played by Toby Stevens. Vivian by Kelly Burke. Carmen by Leah Brotherhead. Agnes by Barbara Barnes. And Mona by Madeline Potter. Brody was played by Sam Dale. General Sternwood by Sean Baker. Lash Canino by Ian Batchelor. Eddie Mars by Henry DeVass. And Cronjager by Jude Akawudike. The director was Claire Grove. Thank you.